right, this is T-Rock. Uh, Devil Dog told me about the Last Chance Cook-Off that he's part of and asked me to be part of it. Can't let a, uh, a jarhead show how it's done. You gotta have a flyboy show you how it's done. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do braised ribs and a campfire Dutch oven. So I'm gonna prep it in here. I'll take it out there, set it up, and do the cooking out there. It's gonna be about 10 to 15 minutes for the prep, and then it's gonna take two and a half to three hours to cook the, uh, the ribs. Okay, cooking in a Dutch oven, we're gonna use good old fashioned square briquettes. We use these because of their specific size. We can calculate by a chart I have how many of these we're gonna need to get to the temperature that we want. Uh, for the 14 inch uh, Dutch oven I have, I'm gonna need 32 briquettes to get it at 350 degrees and keep it there. We'll put 16 underneath and 16 on top. To get them going, I'm gonna use a chimney and some paper. I'm gonna light it up and leave it and let it get white hot while I go in and do the prep. I'm doing it here on my patio. I don't have to worry about the fire spreading. It'll make a little bit of a stain, but it'll sweep off. That's it. I can leave that to, uh, until those get nice and wet, red hot. We're gonna go back in here and we're gonna do the prep. All right. I've got some, uh, some beef ribs here. These are chuck beef, uh, beef ribs. You can use any type of beef rib uh, cut that you want. There's short ribs, there's uh, the longs, there's chuck, there's different types. But this method that we're gonna do called braising will work for any of them. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get this open. Set this to the side, and I'm gonna give these a quick, quick rinse out here, just to get some of the coagulated blood that it's been sitting in, and the vacuum pack off. All right, I'm gonna take a towel, and I'm gonna pat it dry. All right, I'm gonna give them a quick score. And that's going to allow the seasoning to get down beneath the membranes. Now, I'm using kosher salt, coarse kosher salt, on this. People might want to know, why do most cooks and chefs prefer coarse, coarse kosher salt? Flavor-wise, it's pretty much the same as most of the table salt you get. But when you're seasoning, and I sprinkle this on here, I can see the salt, and I can tell how much I put on there to season it. When you use the fine grain salt, you'll put it on there, you can't really see how much you've seasoned. So all I'm gonna do is a little bit of salt and pepper on these. Press it down in there. Oh, that much. We'll spread that around. It's pretty hot out here, so I'm sweating pretty good. It's more seasoning. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm gonna set this off to the side and get it a little bit because I need to get this out of the way in here. I'm gonna rinse my hands off right quick. Since we're cooking this stuff within a short amount of time of prep, I'm not that worried about cross contamination. Uh, the bacteria wouldn't have time to grow and populate, so it's not going to produce anything. We can use the same boards and the same knives as long as we're cooking it within a short period of time. So I'm going to dice up an onion. I'm going to give myself a flat side on it so it doesn't roll around. I'm going to cut off the top end, give it a quick peel to get the skin off. I'm going to do some horizontal cuts that go about three quarters of the way through. And I'll do some verticals the same way. Now when I come down, it's going to fall apart into the dice that I want. 
this is going to be a large dice or what they call a rough chop. All right. So I'm going to use as much of it as I can. Carrots. Cut those in half. Now in French cooking, they have a tendency to use a mixture called a mirepoix. A mirepoix is celery, carrots, and onions. It's 50% onion, 25% carrot, 25% celery. I'm not real big on celery. I'm not going to use it. In Cajun cooking, they have a same setup, but they call it the Trinity. And instead of celery, they tend to use bell pepper. I can't eat bell pepper, so I'm not going to do that either. All right, I'm going to hit that with a little bit of seasoning. You season each part along the way, you're going to build your flavors. All right, I'm going to hit it with a little Worcestershire. Again, I'm building flavors for it. Now, the vegetable base is going to serve a couple of purposes. It's going to get the meat off of the bottom so that the heat flows around it better and it doesn't really stick to the bottom. It's going to add a little bit of flavor to it, and it's going to add an aroma, a fragrance to it. Uh, in cooking, some chefs have very specific mirepoix or uh, seasonings that they prefer to use to produce the, what they call the aromatics. It's kind of like their perfume. It's their signature smell, and it does add some flavor to the product, all right? So not very many ingredients here. I'm going to put just a few vegetables in there. And I'm going to set these down, bone side down. All right. Now braise is when we take a stock or a broth. And we come halfway up meat that we're cooking. It's a combination wet and dry or moist and dry cooking. It's moist because half of it's sitting in liquid and half of it's dry. So we get a little bit of that roast dry uh, flavoring, caramelization on the top. Caramelization in cooking is when we're browning sugar. So the heat and the long cooking is gonna break down some of the proteins creating some sugars. And then when those sugars brown, that's caramelization and we get certain flavors out of that. Meats to use on this are gonna be meats with a lot of uh, connective tissue. Sinew, cartilage, uh, tough meats, the muscles in the animal that get used the most. All right, they're gonna to be tough, but if we use a moist cooking method and do it slow over a long period of time, those tissues break down and you're gonna get a much more tender meat and it's gonna have a lot more flavor. So I've come halfway up, almost, I'm gonna add a little bit. There we go. We're gonna close that up. Now, this is gonna take two and a half to three hours for this to cook at around 300 to 350 degrees, all right? If we wanted to add potatoes to this, we'd do it at the last hour, all right? We could have some potatoes sitting off to the side, cut up, ready to go, and a little bit of salt water, all right? The salt is gonna get in the potatoes and give them some flavoring. If you put your cut potatoes into water, it'll prevent them from browning. So all I gotta do at this point, this is such a simple setup and such a simple recipe to follow, but I'm going to take 18 briquettes and arrange them underneath and put 18 on top. All right. And about every 30 minutes, I'm going to go out and I'll rotate the top and then I'll rotate the entire thing. And that's going to keep even heat distribution 
throughout the cooking process so I don't get hot spots and some parts cook quicker than others. So the Dutch ovens that have the lid on them, the, excuse me, the lid, the lip on them, make it much easier to put the charcoal briquettes on top. It's an oven. It's literally like the oven in your house. It's gonna heat up and trap the heat inside and give co even cooking throughout. Here, you can cook anything in these things. So I'm gonna go out here and I'm gonna check my briquettes. If they're ready to go, I'm just gonna set them on the ground, 18 of them in a circle under this, and set this on top, all right? And I'm gonna start my timer. I'm not gonna really open it up and look at it. I want that steam to go for at least two hours, all right? And then after that, I'll come out and I'll make sure everything's going fine. If I was gonna add my potatoes, I would do it then, and then I would rotate it just a little bit. At the end, we're gonna take them out. We'll set them off to the side for about five to 10 minutes because they're literally gonna be falling apart. Uh, if I set them to the side and let them rest for a few minutes, they'll actually firm up just a little bit. So they'll be tender, but not to where you try to pick it up and it just completely falls apart. So I'm gonna go out here and we're gonna check this and we'll get this going. All right, so it's been about 10, 15 minutes and the coals are getting where I want them. All right, so I'm gonna put some out. They've got white edges. It's gonna be nice and hot. I'm gonna do one, two, three. And these are very hot. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good thing about using these uh, square old-fashioned briquettes is they're going to produce a, a known temperature. They're, if you use chunk uh, lump briquettes, you're not going to be able to get it as easily. So when you're doing Dutch oven, if you have the old square kind, best way to do it. All right, and then I'm going to put 18 of them on top. Probably after an hour and a half or so, I'm going to need to add a few more just to keep it within that temperature range. So I'm going to keep these off to the side and add them. Now I'm looking for these beef ribs. The final temperature is probably going to be around 200, 203 degrees internal temperature. But like I said, I'm going to want to keep them at around 180 or so, 180 to 190 for a period of time in the moist cooking method to break down those connective tissues so they're nice and tender and add a lot of flavor. And, all right, I'm just gonna rotate with the bale, rotate it a little bit so that I keep even cooking all the way around. So I'm gonna address a couple of questions I thought of that might come up when I talked about the sanitation and the bacteria. Typically, when bacteria enter an environment of a specific um, hydration level, water level, acidity, and temperature, it needs time to adjust to that range before it can reproduce. And normally that's around three hours, all right? So if I'm using a cutting board and cutting stuff up and then getting it and cooking it, before that time period, I'm not that worried about cross-contamination because they're all cooking together anyway. In most restaurants, they do a cumulative three hours, all right? So if they take it uh, and it's out of temperature for 45 minutes here, they put it back in the, in the fridge, and then over here they do it, take it out and prep it some more, and it's another 20 minutes, they combine those to a total of three hours. If it goes beyond that, they say it's not safe. That's just extra precaution. Technically, you can take this, have it out for about two hours working with it, put it back in the fridge, or even put it back in the freezer and store it again, and you're not gonna have to worry about the bacteria growth. 
The reason we don't refreeze meat in most products most of the time is the formation of ice crystals gets big in the refreezing process and can damage the meat or the product that we're refreezing. But bacteria-wise, it's not going to be an issue. You can do it. You can refreeze meat and use it and it'll be fine. It's just the texture can be a little bit tougher and it can affect that texture when you're eating it some. The other thing is when I was scoring it a while ago, I only scored the back side, not the front side. There's a membrane on the back of most ribs that doesn't let salt and seasoning get through, so I score that. When I flipped it over, I don't really need to score that side because it doesn't have that membrane. But you can because it's when you score it and it cooks, where you cut it, it's going to separate some due to shrinking and give you more surface area so that more of your spices and seasonings are uh, subject to um, the roasting or the wet and moist method and getting more flavor in there. So you can, but you don't have to. The way I'm doing it, this works fine. We're gonna come back out here in about two, two and a half hours. I'll check on it uh, once or twice just to make sure that the charcoals are still going and the heat's still there. And after about two and a half to three hours for this much ribs and these size, these are gonna be pretty close to being done. So we'll be coming back out and checking on it. But that's it, all we gotta do is let this cook, all right? So we'll come back out in a little bit. So I'm gonna move this inside the garage. It's obviously raining. It's been out here for a couple of hours. We're gonna check it. They may be done. I don't want ash into it, so I'm gonna lift slow and careful. gone quite a ways. It's not fully done. These things are going to be dang, dang near fall apart when they're fully done. The weather cools it down so it's going to take longer and because of the rain it's going to give me problems. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm probably going to have to finish them on the stove or wait for it to stop raining. So I'm going to give it a little while to let it stop raining and if it does, then I can move them back outside. They're gonna be fine sitting like this with the lid back on it, staying nice and warm. This cast iron retains a lot of heat. It hadn't lost at all. So they're gonna to continue to, to baste and braise even at this point. All right, so the rain's passed over. I've set this up out here on my camping stove and I'm gonna finish it here. I need a constant heat and the uh, rain's gotten everything wet, so the charcoals aren't going to uh, work so well. So medium low, and I'm going to finish it on here and, until basically they're fall apart tender. I'm going to keep checking in on it, and I'm uh, going to use a thermometer, and I'm looking for 200 to 205 degrees internal temperature on the meat. Okay, so I've gotten these to the temperature that I want to get them to, and if you'll take a quick look here, you can see the meat has shrunk and pulled back from the bone that's telling me that that's that that's done exactly what it's supposed to do and see how easily that thermometer goes in that meat's very very tender all right so i'm going to go ahead and remove them from uh, the brazing liquid and set them here to rest for five to ten minutes large pieces of meat and well basically everything but especially large pieces of meat are going to continue to rise in temperature for five to ten minutes after you remove from the heat source. It's called carryover cooking. So that temperature is still going to go up some and then it's going to come down a little bit. When it comes down a little bit that meat's going to go from very relaxed and kind of falling apart to tighten up just a little bit so that it'll be nice to eat and not just fall apart and mush. Alright, so I'm going to get Get underneath it. I gotta get underneath those bones. Ah. I'm gonna let this continue to simmer and cook and boil it down some, and it'll help thicken it and make a nice uh, sauce gravy 
I'm gonna move this inside over here while it rests. Okay, so I'm gonna let that rest probably around 10 minutes. Keep stirring that and get that to reduce down some so I have a nice sauce gravy from it. All right, we're back. I'm gonna go ahead, cut into this. instead of a fork, because why not? Take off a little piece and give it a try. Why well, soft, tender, season well? I like it. I like it. Last chance cook off. Uh, this is braised beef ribs in a Dutch oven. Ran into some rain, so we started out over charcoal, finished it out on a gas camping stove outside. Liquid comes halfway up, season them real good, liquid comes halfway up, and we're gonna cook them to an internal temperature anywhere between 195 and 205. It's gonna take, mm, depending on the conditions, if you're doing it outside like for us, instead of the Three hours, I was thinking it went to about four and a half. Uh, the rain just cooled it down and killed everything to where I had to restart it, basically. They're nice and tender, they're flavorful, they're good to go. Uh, that's it, so I hope y'all enjoy. You can make more than just uh, burgers and hot dogs outside. You get you a Dutch oven, you can pretty much make anything. Appreciate it, and thank y'all for watching.